So here it is, celebrating 20 years of distress. I said it all along that I started with brown and I was definitely going to end with a color that was that was meant for me. I said it was a neutral. I mean, I couldn't have I couldn't have given more clues of of what it was, but I thought it's only fitting to round out a palette that started with browns with a brown. And this is scorched timber. To me, it is the ultimate brown. It is my favorite brown now of distress, and I don't really say it, I don't say that lightly because I've had walnut stain is my favorite brown for years, but now scorched timber is my new favorite. Still love it with old paper and frayed burlap and all the other colors of distress, but this one I'm going to take you through and show uh, really what makes it different, what makes it unique. I've said it all along also with these colors that we added to the line. These were very complex colors that we wanted to find a way in, and I will tell you that if you're not a fan of brown, and already you're, you know, going, no, this is, a, click off this computer, shut off my phone, throw it against what I'm telling you now that this brown might make you change your mind, especially if you just like stamping, because the color of this is quite unique to any other brown that I've done in distress. And that's what I, I can't wait to share with you. Because to me, Scorch Timber, it's like this smoldering, deep, dark brown, but it has these charred undertones, almost like a a black or very dark undertone. It's a deep, deep, dark brown, but it has some surprises when you work with these other mediums, whether you work with sprays or paint or glaze. Now, this release also has a pencil. I know many of you noticed that uh, right away where it's like, well, hold on, there, there's a pencil in this one. And I can tell you the reason we did a pencil in this one is because the rest of the pencils in Distress will be released the end of this month. We, we launched three of the the sets of 12, we have another three coming out. But remember, Picket Fence, white, that was in the first release. And that's technically not a distressed color. It's certainly not one of the 72. It does exist in the palette, uh, but it doesn't exist in every medium. So therefore, it's not really an official color. Um, but because we had white in there, it kind of messed up the count. And I said to Ranger, I'm like, we can't have a, a color not exist. So that's why we did the pencil. This way, when the rest of the pencils come out at the end of the month, we have a complete palette. And I'll talk about some other things that we have in addition to Scorch Timber. But yes, this is the final color. Can we it's just beautiful. take a minute yes. to talk about the name? Scorch I love it. Scorch Timber. Scorch Timber. Yeah, it's like charred wood, it's like right? Tim. Scor yes. Scorch Tim. It yeah, does. Timber. You're Timber. You're, it does have my name in it. Timber. Seriously. <laughs> Timber. Oh, there you go. That's a new. Hey, Timber. Timber. It does. See, there you go. Timber. Thanks, Mario. Timber. Yes, I wanted Timber. I wanted to name the final color with my name. That's good. <laughs> hey, I'll never forget that. That's Timber. that is totally right. So, yes. Scorch Timber. Let let's get let's get into it. I'm going to I'm going to move this off to the side. Take this out and we'll I'll pull in the products. So, let me just Timber. Yeah. Timber. 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 Okay. Let me just pull this in. I, I do have to just peel off a little bit of putty up the back of some stuff. Let's get this in. Mario can take that. Thanks, Mario. There you go, Timber. There you go. Thanks. Oh, no. <laughs> That's not going to be a good nickname. Okay. So let's talk about Scorched Timber. Timber. I'll just emphasize Tim from now on. Scorched Timber. Um, so you can see with all of the other distress, it comes in all of the colors. It also comes uh, in the pencil. In addition to this, before I get into the swatches, I said to Ranger, look, since we are wrapping up this palette, okay, and we're, we're going in and really finishing everything, typically when we launch the colors, the Distress Crayons and the mini Distress Inks follow months later. And I'm like, because it's a celebration, and I know it was a huge ask of Ranger, can we just do it all? So really, a shout out to everyone at Ranger, because we also launched the mini Distress with the new color. So it's got Scorched Timber. It also has... Uh, all of the last ones, Lost Shadow, Lumberjack Plaid, and Uncharted Mariner. There is also the crayon set. So instead of waiting to complete your palette, because many of you are waiting to complete the palette, now regardless of whatever Distress uh, product you have or you collect, even if you have all of them, you don't have to wait for Scorch Timber to be in that product because there's also that set of crayons. Uh, I want to talk real quick also about the Distress crayons because this is something I had to figure out. Um, so typically for the new colors, because now we have a palette of 12 new colors that we that we added to the palette over time since 2020, uh, the crayons always came out in little groups of three, <clears throat> and each one of those had a set name. There's also six pack sets that contain the new colors. So if you're just starting out in crayons, you can either go the three pack route or you can get the six pack that has like 
this would be the, the first six colors and of course the final six. So you do have options when it comes to distress crayons. I just wanted to point that out that if you look at set numbers, especially if you're ordering by the number and you're like, oh, wait a minute, you know, I don't have that set. These sets, these larger sets contain those new three packs. It's just totally up to you how you want to, how you want to purchase the product. Okay, let's get into the colors. Okay, because I love it. When it comes to brown, and I know some people will really think that we don't need another brown, and I would completely disagree with you, and that's okay. I can. The whole idea behind a palette is looking at colors, looking at values, looking at, at hues of color and how we see color, and more importantly in the world of distress, the undertones. The undertones to me, because distress is a water reactive product line, specifically in the inks, but of course all the products when it comes to paint and sprays, they're all water reactive. But those undertones, that's really what makes it super complex for the chemist. So serious shout out to the chemist at Ranger for not only formulating colors, but being very mindful of the undertones. Cause that's what I tell them. Like, I want this color, but I want to make sure that it wicks in this, this, and this. And they're like, oh, and so it limits them in the, in the types of dyes they can use to create a color. Right? Normally they might want to use a red or whatever, but if I'm like, I don't want any red undertones, okay, they have to try to match colors, but make sure that the undertones mimic the end result. So in the world of brown, I'm just going to kind of swatch this out. And, and there's, I'm going to go through more than just these for browns, but this is where I see this kind of fit into the distress palette. Let me line these up, make sure I'm in frame, all that. All that jazz, there we go. So we've got ink pads and we have oxides because those are the ones that I, I kind of do uh, swatches for, drags of it. All right, so we'll start with gathered twigs. And, and we're saying that as we get in from the warm browns into the cool browns because scorched timber is a cool brown versus it doesn't have a lot of those uh, red, yellow, orange tones. So gathered twigs to me is the darkest of the warm. It's darker than vintage photo and I'll show you some stamped elements. Walnut stain has always been the jam. Walnut stain has been my favorite. I love this. It is a great uh, middle of the road in between. Then we did ground espresso. Now ground espresso is in fact a dark brown, but you can clearly see those red undertones because after all, coffee beans, they do have like that reddish, wonderful uh, look to them. But for scorched, I wanted something very different. I wanted it really dark. I wanted it to look sometime grayish, sometimes greenish sometimes black and sometimes brown. And that was really where Scorch Timber fits in. You can see that it is definitely a very cool brown, beautiful gray undertones. When you wet it and wick it, oh, it is, it is just scorched and, and delightful. And actually, then we get into kind of that grungy neutral zone, which the next one would be pumice stone. So it, it could actually be a dark version of pumice stone or have some values of that, that grungy grime but you can see really where it fits in from the ink world. Completely different brown, totally different values. And the oxides are no different. Of course, the oxides, it is a fusion of dye and pigment. So not only do you get the, the wicking value of the dye, you get the opacity of a pigment, but also in, if you wet this, which I did, you'll start to get this oxidation. You see how that color changes with that little chalky finish. That's what I love about oxides. Only if you wet them. If you don't wet them, they won't oxidize. So here you can see gathered twigs, you get that, that warmth, those undertones. Walnut stain, you get that great brown. Ground espresso, definitely that red wicking again. And here we have scorch. So this is what I was saying. You start getting those, that, that greenish value, I see it more in, in oxide than anything else because oxides are a different formulation. You know, now we're introducing pigment, so we're gonna get some different nuances than we would normally get with a dye ink. And then pumice stone, especially pumice. Like look at how, how much lighter pumice stone is in an oxide because when you add white to that color, it really does look like, well, pumice stone. So, so good. I, I'm so grateful of the comments. I'm, I'm distracted today more than any other day because it's like, not that I want validation. I just want to make sure that you guys are loving it as much as I do. So thanks, Sarah, Mary, so Stampers, Vicky, Julie. Thanks, you guys. Like I, I just, I do love it. It's very, and when you see it, working with other colors and that's the whole idea of these new color reveal live so it's not just about showing you the color but we've got you know some other swatches and of course makes to see it because that does make a huge difference but i wanted you to see uh, the color itself okay now before i get into the swatch specifically of scorched i mentioned 
stamping because yes, I'm a big background inker user, okay? But Distress and Oxide are stamping inks. They're not permanent inks, but they're great stamping inks. So I wanted to take you through kind of all the neutrals in the Distress line now that we have finished that with Scorched. And we'll start with the two lightest, pretty much favorites as well. This is antique linen and old paper. And I think it's important to familiarize yourself with the overall palette of Distress because some people said, oh, I wish you would do like a cream color. Well, antique linen is a cream color. Uh, is it super light cream? Not necessarily because it definitely has some yellow values in the oxide, but you can always mix and match. You can create a DIY pad. You can always add a little bit of white to it with picket fence. Uh, often if you're going to stamp, you can, I'll, I'll talk about that a little later, how we can add multiple inks to a stamp. Old paper, I would still say that in all of the distress colors, as weird as that is, this would be my favorite, my favorite of all time. I don't know why um, it was one of the originals. It's just this weirdish greenish. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is about it, but I use it to blend more than anything else. When I'm doing backgrounds and I want to create like a little dingy muck, I go with old paper because it's, it's just this beautiful color that gives it a, a grime, almost like a moldy color, I guess, if you will. Weird, right? Okay. Then I just went in and stamped. I stamped inks and I stamped oxides. You'll see the colors are very similar, but dyes are of course gonna be more intense when it comes to stamping. This is just stamped on a white heavy stock just to show you the true color. So we go in and we start with tea dye. Tea dye is definitely very orange, very tea stained for a brown. I love that. It, I think it's really important to kind of remember the colors. Then we have vintage photo and vintage photo you can see is definitely um, a, a very, like reddish brown. I'm sorry, this isn't, this is vintage, but I'm like, that's not red. red. This is brush corduroy. I don't even know my colors. Uh, brush corduroy. Vintage photo, this is where you get the red, okay? That red in vintage photo is super important because it's, it's very sepia, very sepia tone. And then of course we have gathered twigs. Now, when you look at these warm browns, they all have different values in and of themselves. This one, brush corduroy, it's got a little bit more yellow in it, a little bit more yellow orange. As I mentioned, vintage photo, definitely a little bit more uh, red. Then we went to gathered twigs, we kind of darkened it up. And then we get into kind of the cooler browns. Frayed burlap, definitely uh, another great neutral, kind of a, a dirty, dirty gray, very similar to mushroom, I think, in alcohol ink is frayed burlap, in my opinion. Then we have walnut stain. So now when you compare walnut stain to vintage photo, you can see this is a, a very warm brown. This is very cool. Then we have the ground espresso. So that's dark, but still a little red value. So when you put it under there, you can start picking up that little red, especially different from this. And then we have scorch. And this is where scorch becomes really interesting because it kind of, when you, when you just compare it to browns, it looks almost black. But then when you compare it to black soot, you can see, wait, okay, wait a minute. It's definitely got more brown value than black. So it's really great to stamp, especially for backgrounds when you don't necessarily want black. So maybe you're doing florals or maybe you're doing text or maybe you're doing background stamping that you want something really dark to show up, but you don't necessarily want it black because you want to be able to stamp a sentiment over it. This is where Scorched fits in. And then of course, these cool neutrals, we have uh, pumice stone, Lost Shadow, love that color, and Hickory Smoke. So now when you see like pumice stone compared to frayed burlap, very different. Frayed is definitely has more uh, brown value than pumice stone, which is more gray. And the same goes for the oxide. So the oxide, you're definitely going to get a little bit more definition when you stamp with it because it is a, a dye and pigment. So you'll just get, you can see in the lines of that, you just get way more definition all the way across the board. See, see the difference even in scorched because a dye has a tendency to want to travel, but a dye and pigment keeps everything a lot more crisp. But even here, you can see that these browns, we've got walnut and ground espresso, still dark, still a little red, but not as charred as scorched timber was. Again, almost black. If you didn't compare it to black, you would think, oh, okay, I, I could stamp with this. And I really love how this completes those neutrals. Like I said, I know many people are like, I don't think we need another brown yeah we did we really did we needed that ultimate dark kind of chameleon brown where when you pair it with different things uh it it definitely changes even from a wicking value now wicking is like i said the important part of how uh, distress really plays around this is just scorched timber and just sprayed but you can see it wicks in many many unique ways you get this black buildup, almost char like 
but then you also get kind of these smoky vibes that whole scorch look where sometimes you might have a little glow where it looks kind of reddish for an ember but it really has more of that green dark value blending this is walnut stain like i said this has been my go-to forever and walnut stain you're like yeah that that's a really nice uh, dark what we would consider a cool brown this is walnut stain with a little bit of scorch blended on top and then splash with water see how it changed that i'm still getting those great values of walnut stain but scorched is something that yes you can use by itself but just just be aware if you use it by itself it's dark it's it's meant to be dark it's deep dark but really the reason i wanted to have scorched is because i wanted to be able to add it to any other color so instead of whenever I wanted a dark value, instead of going in with black soot, which we know is incredibly powerful and just black, it, it dominates so many other colors, Scorch Timber is going to give us that really dark value, but still allow us to appreciate the color we started with. So that's something I want you to be mindful of when you're, if you're, if you're getting this color and you're working with it, play around with it by itself, but just know that it's, it's really dark. But when you blend it and put it with any other color, you just create the, this depth because you get this really great saturation, but it's, to me, it's these black outlines that Scorch provides, almost black, it really isn't. It's a, it's a dark, dark brown, but it's those outlines that to me changes how an ink background works, okay? Beautiful, right? Totally beautiful, love, love the colors. Um, in, in the crayon and pencil, well, well, we'll talk about all the swatches real quick so we can get into, into the creative stuff because I think that when you look at the colors, and this is a, a swatch that Zoe did, um, how you use these colors, wh whether it's any browns or not, really does impact its color value. And I think that's important to understand as a maker. When you're looking for colors, when you're seeing things on the internet, um, and you're like, oh, I love that color. It's really important to find out how they applied that color. Did they stamp it? Did they you know, add water to it? Did they blend it? Okay, all of those things, because these, these swatches, Zoe did this on the, the new Sizzix Star, these are blended. Now, by doing blends, you're really picking up a, a lot of dark and lights because the paper isn't as saturated with color as if it was, if it was direct to paper or a lot of water. But you can see that same kind of swatch, the tea dye. Here you can really pick up that yellow value in brush corduroy or vintage photo, gathered twigs, frayed burlap, walnut stain, ground espresso, they're scorched. So see, even blended. Ooh, it's so good because it does it kind of looks like this dark dirty gray now especially when it's over black see how it changes crazy it is it's it's one of those things it's like you look at the label and you're like eh, denied uh, don't don't judge a book play with it you know if you have a store that that has a sample pad you can go in and try it out see the color in real life it's it's pretty magical huh? because it does it it's that bridge from brown to gray that's why i said to me it was the ultimate neutral because it it just kind of becomes seamless, especially in this little quadrant right here. So I love seeing that. I love all the different, love all the different values of that. Okay, let's get into the swatches. All right, keep this. Thanks, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mario. I'm gonna put this here. Let's get the other brown. I'll get distracted. You know me, I'll get this distracted with all the other ones. I'll set that over there. Okay, let's get into swatches. Super fun, my favorite. Okay, timber. <clears throat> so swatches, it really is about how the color plays based off the different mediums. And this is one of the things that adding the new color has been amazing because we've been able to not only add a color, but add a color in all the different mediums. And I love that. I love seeing that. So with Scorch Timber, we'll start with the ink pad. The type of paper you use also impacts the color, especially when you're working with dyes. Dyes are translucent. So this is Distress Watercolor Cardstock. The other is Distress Mixed Media Heavy Stock. So you can see one has a little bit uh, of an off-white color and one is completely white. And I, I like to do swatches. I've always done the swatches on both of those so you can see that. So this is just using the ink pads, smashing it down and layering it wet. So really you can appreciate the values of that color. This is blended just on watercolor. So there again with Scorch, do you see what I mean? How you can get that ultimate char, but you can also get a really nice light, believe it or not, light dark value in the background, if that makes sense. So if you really are light handed when you do a background, you can get some great uh, scorched look to the background. 
when you use it on mixed media, see how just changing the paper, how it does give it a little bit more of a warmer value, but you're still getting that scorched. But if you're ever trying to get a warmer value of a color, look at your cardstock. You know, go to Manila Tags or Mixed Media because that paper really does, even from a blending perspective, change that value quite a bit. So it is important to, to be mindful of, of what kind of paper you're working on, okay? So those are ink pads, again, wet and dry. Then we get into oxide. Now oxide, because it oxidizes, we're still gonna get those dark values, but we also get a little bit of a unique play because the oxidation softens everything, almost like a filter. Blends like a dream. So even with an oxide, we're getting those really dark values because this one is not wet. So that's why the blend looks darker than the wet because this is oxidized, it's got water. This, no water, so no oxidation. But look at that transition of color. Oof. Definitely much warmer on mixed media. You can see some yellow values because again, that's the paper picking that up, going through the dye. And then of course, uh, the blend. This is really interesting, the blend on this one. Like just how, how much warmer that scorched is, but still darker than uh, gathered twigs or really any of those other warm colors. Then the sprays. Now, if you play around with sprays, if you haven't played with sprays before, sprays are a fluid version of the ink pad, okay? It's not, it's not a re-inker per se, but it is a fluid version. So you have to think of an ink pad and if you were wringing it out and you had all that color, so that's why when you place it down on paper, it is incredibly saturated. So with scorched, a little goes a long way. This one was sprayed and then just a little bit of water flicked on it so you can see how it models. I always say when you do some sprays, you may want to start with uh, a little bit of water first so you get more of this movement. Otherwise, you're going to get a really heavy saturation. Same thing on mixed media. Not much of a change, but a little bit. A little bit of a subtle change. This, I think you see more of the cooler values. Oxide spray, I should have the sprays in instead of ink pads, there we go. Uh, oxide spray, really cool, just how it oxidizes. Watercolor, mixed media, yum. But see the oxidized version, crazy what it does. See, oxides always have this weird property, that frayed burlap kind of turns green. This one has this almost rusty value, it's wild. It is so wild how uh, the difference between a spray stain and an oxide spray. So see, sometimes when people see this, they're like, Oh, a spray is a spray is a spray. I have this one. I don't need this one or I have this. I don't need this. Well, that might be true, but you can see that the, the properties of that, the color is distinctly different. I like to use them both together because I get that really uh, charred look, but man, this has such a great rust value to it. I don't know if you can appreciate that. It's like a, a yellowy orange muck. It's very, very cool in an oxide spray. You would get that with the oxide pad too, but you have to add so many layers to kind of create that. Beautiful, right? So good, so good. And then we get into paint. Now distress paint, of course, a water reactive paint. So cool if you just paint it on, but also great if you add water and marble. So these swatches, this shows it painted on, and like with any kind of paint. Uh, keep in mind that distress paint does not contain any fillers. So many people kind of forget that, I think, when they're using distress paint on other substrates, like maybe chipboard or wood. If you put distress paint on and you paint on a layer and you wipe it off, it is like a wood stain, okay? It's not as fluid as a stain, but it is more fluid than a regular acrylic paint because it doesn't have the filler. So this is one layer of paint brushed on, wiped off. This is the same scorched, brushed on, dried, and brushed on again, so two coats of that paint. So it's really cool on that paint that you can get a really nice antiquing by painting it on, wiping it off, or just painting on, you get that great opacity. But when you wet it, this is what the paint does. And the cool thing about wetting paint, because you might be like, well, wait a minute, Captain Obvious, why do I need this watery paint if I've got the watery spray? This medium is permanent when dry. It's the only distressed medium that when you paint it on uh, and you put it onto any surface, whether that's wood or fabric or paper, um, it is permanent when dry, even metal, okay? So by doing this, you can create this effect on a canvas or an art journal, with paint, and once this dries, even though it looks like ink, you can stamp, you can add crayons, you can add pencils, you can do anything you want, and this will never re-wet because it's paint. So that's what's really cool about Distress Paints and Water is you can create these cool effects and then you have a permanent layer to work on, especially from mixed media. Paint's not gonna be much different on paper because paint is complete pigment. There is no dye in there. So 
Opacity is the same, but you still get a couple little values when you use it as, as a stain when you wipe it off. And then look at the background on that one. Ooh, mixed media is definitely more uh, water friendly. So I think the fluid movement on this paper, a little different than this one. You know, this one has a little uh, bumpity chunkities on there. So not, it's not really chunky, but these little bumps, these little uh, pits holds onto the paint. And this is totally smooth, smooth roadway. Beautiful, right? So good. So just imagine that because it kind of looks like, like a tree bark. So taking a canvas and just doing paint and, and water and letting it dry, it just looks like this piece of wood, but it's really canvas. That's so good. All right, then we have the glaze. So the embossing glaze is translucent. Now, because this is a dark color, it is translucent, but you're gonna have to make sure that whatever you put underneath it, if you're trying to get layers to show, is also very intense, right? Like black ink, because otherwise, if you don't, it's going to cover it up. But you can still get some great layers and you're gonna see from the makes uh, how cool glaze is on cards. But this is an embossing powder, but it is translucent, it's not opaque. And that is why on these two papers, you can see the color difference because it's translucent. So on white, we're seeing that true color value. And on mixed media, we're seeing those warm values. So that's a fun thing of embossing glaze. Um, even if you're doing standard card embossing, not just you know doing a background, but literally embossing a sentiment, a lot of times you can get an embossing powder to match your project better with a glaze than an opaque powder because an opaque powder is just going to be say that red or that pink. But if you use a pink glaze on your pink cardstock, it will still show up and coordinate with your cardstock. So don't forget that. It's not just about mixed media techniques. It's really uh, a great embossing powder for all things. Then we have the crayon and the pencil. Now, because these are both pigment and both water reactive, you know, the color values, I try to balance whether I'm trying to match the ink pad or the oxide. So you can see right here, like, oh, these don't even match each other. Well, no, not really, but this is more oxide-ish. Remember I said it has that kind of those rusty values, so that's what I chose to do for the crayon. For the pencil, I went more for the ink. So when I, when I work with both of these two products, I like to try to balance, do I want it to look more like the ink pad or the oxide? Doesn't mean all crayons match oxide and all pencils match ink, it's just whatever I see and obviously whatever the factory can, uh, can match. So that's very cool to know on, on both of these products, you're gonna get a different color element. And then I just paired up uh, just some swatches. I don't need, that's just the crayon one. But just to kind of show you, cause I did talk about different values where you're like, okay, but is scorched green? Well, it has some green values, but clearly when you put it next to a green, right? This is forest moss, which is a very dark green wick, but you can see that it's, it's definitely brown. But if you didn't use it with a green, it could take on a green hue. Next to black, side by side, you can clearly tell that it's brown, but you saw when it was stamped, it was very similar to that. And then for gray, where you're like, oh, it's kind of a gray. Well, it is, but when you put it right next to a gray, it's still gonna read as a brown. So that's the importance to, to understand as we go into the makes, that the makers use scorched timber, but it's going to look so different from make to make because of the colors that maybe they paired it with or put it next to, okay? So, did I do okay, Mario? You did. I'm trying to get through so much information because I have so much to talk about, but, okay, that's good. I try. All right, move this out of the way. No, you can, you can kind of hear I'm moving everything, right? Yeah, I'll take that. I'll All right, that. thank you. Okay, I'm gonna bring this one in. This, we'll kind of start with the little make swatch. So, Zoe sent this for the live, this little swatch. I do love the trees, I do love the woodland trees. And, so she did kind of a swatch and I thought this was really good because this will uh, kind of let me talk about the 12 colors. Believe it or not, we started in, in 2020 adding colors to the line. And those colors, of course, um, took a little bit longer than expected. We had a, a pandemic in there as well, but this was supposed to be a year. And here we are starting in 2020 and finishing in 2024, but we did it. So these were the 12 new colors that we uh, most recently added to Distress, and that would be able to just kind of take a little trip down memory lane, right? You guys remember these colors. Kitsch Flamingo. We have Saltwater Taffy. And you can see how different they are as well. Lumberjack Plaid, Great Red. Crackling Campfire, mm -hmm. love that color. Rustic Wilderness, I kind of think I was in having some camping vibes, I don't know. Uh, Salvage Patina, love that. Uncharted Mariner, probably just like, I don't know, one of, one of the ones that surprised me the most. I use Uncharted more than I ever thought I would. Of course, Speckled Egg, 
this was just such a beautiful blue when we did it. It's just a wonderful, beautiful color. Then prize ribbon, that wonderful, vibrant, but also could be considered navy. Purple lovers were so happy with Villainous Potion, that dark, dark purple. Lost Shadow, of course we had Lost Shadow, and then of course, Scorched Timber. So when you see that and, and then of course add it to uh, that brown, you have a complete color. So do you have those swatches? What did I do with them? Right here. I just yes. had them. Ah, thanks. Sure. Like I had them right there. There we go. We'll throw that in. See, so we kind of complete it and I know, yes, Zoe did it right. We have brown and then gray. But you can see that there was always a mission. And I mentioned this in, in previous lives that you know, these weren't something that I was figuring out on the go. When we added 12 colors, I knew the 12 colors I wanted. So it was already done. And, and yes, there was no yellow, but I've been there, done that. We've got plenty, 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 <laughs> plenty of yellow. So we won't go there, but you can, you can create a lot of elements. It was funny. I don't even know what live it was when I went up. And anyone that watched it, they're like, okay, noted. There will not be a yellow. Okay. Well, hey, that's just how it is, right? That's how I am. I am I am who I am there we go Thank thanks you. Mario okay so and I'm not stalling I'm not trying to do anything I just want to talk Don't about stalling. I just want to talk stop about colors so <laughs> I know you'll start with that you're like would you please stop talking okay so the happiest moment was when I was able to finally fill all of my tins because if you guys are a collector of minis and I know many of you are I know this was incredibly frustrating because it was like you were doing the shuffle every time and you're like, I just want the minis because I just want to be able to finish uh, my palette. Well, now you can. Well, look at okay. That beauty. So now we have the 72 colors of Distress. Absolutely beautiful, beautiful colors to work with. You can see that those 12 were important. As I mentioned, when we added those 12, they had very specific purpose. You know, Kitsch really needed to be that pink that that kind of bridge between spun sugar and picked raspberry, and it did. That crackling campfire needed to kind of be that red russet that as we went into the oranges, we kind of pulled that red along with it, which it did. Yellows, totally done. We have a straw yellow, a lemon yellow, a mustard yellow, a, an umber. We have a yellow orange like wild honey. So yellow was, was done for me. As we went into greens, we needed some things. You know, we needed rustic wilderness because we didn't have that, that really true uh, dark hunter green, if you will. Forest moss was too dirty and mowed lawn was definitely too bright. As we got into the blue greens, going into the teals, we needed salvage patina. We needed that, that greenish turquoise. We needed uncharted mariner because we needed that really dirty blue. We already had broken china. We had mermaid lagoon. It was beautiful. Speckled egg. I know a lot of people didn't think we needed a light blue, but weathered wood and stormy sky are, are very, very dirty, but also kind of greenish, one of them. So we needed that. And just as we go through the blue, we needed prize ribbon, we needed villainous. So everything was intentional from day one. It, it truly was, okay? So here's a little history of distress. And I typed it out and I won't bore you with dates, but it's fascinating because I think some people think, oh, well, yeah, you're, you're Tim Holtz. Did. You woke up one day and distress was here. <laughs> and it, it didn't happen that way. In January, you woke up one day and it was here. In January of 2004 is when the six original colors of Distress debuted. And truth be told, it actually won two awards at that show. This was a time where at the trade show, the attendees would vote on their favorite product. And remember, this was a product that Ranger really wasn't sure anybody even wanted. It won the Innovations Award, two Innovation Awards, not just one, two. One for most innovative product in the stamping and scrapbooking category, and also the most innovative product of that trade show for the year. And that was voted on by the attendees, not a, not a group of people, not a popularity contest. It was really about that. So it was quite, quite the, the accolade to have really is to, to have that. Then shortly after, just six months after, and I can hold this up. So if you guys want to kind of read along with me, six months later, we, we expanded the palette. We doubled it because we did all the Browns, but then right away people were like, Oh, well, hold on. Like we need some colors. And I'm like, Ooh, I don't know, but distress was supposed to be Brown. So that's where we added some new colors, like a, a pink and a red and a yellow and a green and a light blue and a, a weird purple, because I wasn't really sure what was going to go on with this, but clearly we understood it. We were using it for tinting photos, all of that. So a year later, we doubled that. It was like Ranger was on board. We were moving and grooving. We're like, okay, so by 
uh, October of 2005, we decided to add 12 new colors, just boom. Now, this was a time, of course, that we really only had Distress ink pads, not all this other stuff that we have today. So we were focusing only on ink pads. We didn't have paint and spray and crayons and pencils and glazes, and we didn't even have oxide, we're just focusing on ink. And then we were content. People were content. We were using 24 colors forever, five years, in fact. We didn't have a new color for five years. And five years later, we did some new distress colors. Five we added, years. I know, it's like a, it's really, it's, I mean, just think, that's a long time. But in those five years, we added some other things. Oh, I mean, so, so, so in there, like we had paint, we did embossing patterns, we were playing around with things. But yeah, it was a five year, not much of anything. And then we added 12 new colors. And those 12 colors, that's where we started really playing. We knew what distress was, we knew what people were, were using it for. And this is where we got really creative with those colors. The, the bundled sage and crushed olive and forest moss and tumble glass. And it's very cool to add those. That was in 2010. Then this year was the year that everyone at Ranger remembers. This was a year that I'm like, wouldn't it be fun if we did Distress Ink in seasonal colors? Little three pack of just ink pads, no re-inkers, mind you. Okay, these were just ink pads. They were sold in a stack of three and we launched them each season. We did uh, a launch in spring, in summer. We actually started with fall though. So we kind of went backwards. We started with a fall release that was ripe, persimmon, seedless and gathered. Then we added festive berries, ice spruce, evergreen bow at Christmas. Then peacock feathers, squeeze lemonade, shaded lilac in spring. And then pick raspberry, mowed lawn, and salty ocean. Now think about this. These colors were never to exist in the distress line. Never. How crazy is that? Like that to me is, is something that I, I think it's really hard to, to fathom because, it, and it wasn't because we were trying to create this, this frenzy or whatever in the marketplace. We honestly felt that at this point, 36 colors, everyone was completely happy with it. Now at this point, think about this, we were also only halfway through the palette that it is today in 2010, we're halfway through. So these seasonal colors early on, like Ranger was bombarded where people were like, absolutely not, I want re -inkers. you can't make these one and done. And so with, within that moment, Ranger's like, okay, they're gonna be part of the line. So it was great. So, you know, you guys, the voice really does matter. It won't matter now if you say that you want more than 72 because I'm happy with the palette of 72. But at this point, we added those colors. Then we were set for another three years. And then this is the year that kind of changed the dynamics for the final part of Distress. This is where at this point, Distress had built up. We had sprays, we had other mediums. And I said to, to Ranger, I'd love to add some new colors. I'd love to do one a month, but would you, would you please consider doing it in more than just the ink pad? Because by now, we also had uh, just some other products. We had like, I think markers, yeah, markers came out at this point, those came out in 2012. But still at this point when we we're working with this, as crazy as this seems, we still did not have oxide, right? We're still just talking about distress ink and sprays, no oxide, we had no oxide at all. So we added these colors, it was a one a month thing, very much like what you guys have been seeing for the new color, but it was very regimented. It was every single month there was a new color, the stores had it, it was the same surprise idea. We didn't have pins or anything at that point. And then after we did that, we were happy with it. And I was like, wouldn't it be cool if we could do a white? I know everybody wants a white distress ink. And that's where the chemist is like, there is no such thing as a white dye. Let's, let's educate you. White is a pigment. It's like chalk. So you can't see through chalk. So you can't see through white. You can make a watered down version of a pigment. So it has a little bit of translucency, but it can't be, there's no white dyes. And I'm like, okay then let's just add picket fence distress ink. And that's why it's a distress ink. There was no oxide, okay? It was just ink. But this, because they were able to put this white, creamy, almost chalky-like ink in a distress pad, it sparked my idea for oxide. And that is when I said to Ranger, wouldn't it be cool if we took picket fence, the, the ink that you put in here, and added it to a color of distress and make this like part dye, part, pigment ink pad and like, oh, it's weird. Yeah, I agree. It would be, would be weird. Let's call it an oxide. Oh, that's a terrible name. No one's going to like it. It sounds toxic. I'm like, it sounds cool and intriguing. So in 2017, we released oxide and that's where this kind of five year stint, uh, another break. So the last new color, if you think about it was 2015, then we started adding oxides and oxide sprays and archivals and glaze and micocene. So much stuff happened in these five years, but from the palette, we kicked back up in 2020, right? Five years after we did that whole run of colors 
and that's where we brought it today to 2024 for the final color. So from 2004, it really was a 20 year journey of building this palette. And each thing was sometimes accidental, like on the seasonal colors, and other times very mindful of bringing colors uh, in a way based on how you guys use it. So uh, it's really humbling to kind of look at that timeline and be like, wow, we've come such a long way with distress. And distress sparked other ideas, so right? A lot of people would uh, like you to post the timeline on your blog when you post? Sure, yeah, your, I'll do that. Okay. Yeah, if, if that interests you, I see. Yeah, I mean, like and lot, here I thought that'd lot. be the boring history lesson. No, people, All right. it's, I'm reading it so much. The, well, thank you guys. This is gonna be a blast from the past. Distress along the way. Who that guy? Sparked, <laughs> yeah. Who that guy right there? I don't know. I'm like from Rascal Flatts. Yeah, it's like a TV yeah. Uh, food channel. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Guy Fieri? Oh my gosh. I said Rascal Flatts, you thought Guy Fieri. You were Guy Fieri before Guy Fieri? Could be. Could be. The Frosted Tips. So this, this was when I did a collaboration with a book company called Design Originals. They did craft books back in the day when I worked at Ben Franklin. Um, and they just did so, so many amazing kind of books. But this is where Distress was really taking off. These books came out in 2005. One year, mind you, after Distress was launched. Right? Distress was so unique to people that it needed education and design originals like we need to do a whole book on distress. But in order to do that, I wanted other little elements. So I designed papers for them. I mean, you could see in here like just how old school some of these supplies were, but uh, design little little papers called distressables and doodads. We did little little papers. This is we didn't have ideology back then. So there wasn't any of this stuff. This was me just finding junk and using it like mint tins. But you can look at a lot of this product and see it in ideology today. How crazy is that, right? To kind of look at these elements and be like, oh my gosh, there's a product today. We had pocket watches. My little niece Martika, look at that. So long ago and filling bottle caps. I mean, anything that we could do uh, with product, working on dominoes, and it was just really, really surreal to create education. We did beeswax collage, which sparked two books about using distressables. And I mean, here, this is when I clearly had my funk on where, you know, doing, doing jewelry, a ruler book, so when I did stuff for a company called Junkets, Collage, right? So many beautiful, beautiful elements. We had just great, great fun. And you'd see a lot of this stuff, again, kind of spun into, into ideology. Really wild. Oh my gosh, but I yeah. saw that picture in New York. Which one? <laughs> that one in front of my dad's office. What's There's Mario. <laughs> Look at him. Whoa, way back then. Oh my gosh, who that yeah. guy? I know, it's crazy, right? It's just, when you see this stuff, I mean, yeah, when it was like customizing your craft tools with wood blocks and paper, just fun, fun ideas. But see, I would say like creativity is, it is timeless. It truly, truly is. So we did the books and then we had like cardstock. We did distressable uh, cardstock with coordination. That was like 2011 and most recently. And then honestly, I'm going to get onto the makes, but this was, I, I think the final uh, creativation that I went to where we did a distress challenge and I made this piece and you may have seen it. We've done like uh, some that great, so some great charity pieces. This isn't the one that, uh, the original one, because this is just one that I did. You'll see why I did it. Um, but the original ones we've auctioned off for some great charities for that art piece. But I loved seeing distress colors block like this. It was really uh, quite clever. And this sparked the latest distress collab with a fabric company. So uh, Free Spirit Fabrics that does all of my fabrics for eclectic elements. This one was actually launched in October. Um, rumor has it that it's sold out in many places already, uh, but there will be a live for this actually next month because the makers are working on it. But this is called Color Block. And this is taking this art, that's why I had to break it down, and we scanned it in. So that's real distress, real crayon, I did this one. And we scanned it in to do digital fabric. So take a look at this fabric. This was really inspired by Diane, Diane Reebley because she always looked at this and she saw this very, at the, at the first show when we had this piece, she goes, this will look gorgeous on fabric. I'm like, there's no way they could screen all of those ink spots and all that. She goes, oh my gosh, I would love it in fabric. So a shout out to Diane for the idea. So when I brought it to Free Spirit, they're like, oh, well we could do digital print. And I'm like, does it look the same? She goes, you'd be surprised how great it is. So this comes in, this is cotton. It comes in three different square sizes, but look at the, I mean, it's like so, real so dimensional it's crazy so these are the three sizes in cotton look at that grunge even down to the crayon the scratchy and then canvas cloth so this is a this is a lightweight canvas it's not like you know 
heavy duty artist canvas, but it definitely has see that thicker canvasy texture. Isn't that great to do pillows or whatever? So I just wanted to share before I, you know, get into the Scorch makes that Distress has really been the palette that changed everything and it sparked a lot of other things. It sparked collaborations, it sparked other product ideas. You just never know. And I think that's important to, as a maker or even as a creative, be open to that, right? No kidding. I mean, they really, they match that fabric so beautiful. It's incredible. It really is. It's so beautiful. It's a good job. But I can't say, you know, that I sat there in 2004 and like, mm -hmm, I've got this whole idea for this palette and sprays and paint. And it just, it wasn't that at all. It was just about like, okay. Really everything that you ended up with was all out of a necessity, really. Like there was no. Yeah. I would say it kind of happened. It, it's like happenstance. There was no like, plan for it. It just happened. Anything. Happened like, due to circumstance. You so, wanted this and, oh, where could you get it? And you yeah, wanted that. And then, it didn't exist. Right. So be open to happenstance, right? It's a circumstance that things just happen. That and really you're like, there true. we go. Yeah. I'll take Thanks, that. Mario. Cool. Okay. I'll just keep all this stuff close by. So well, just in case, you know, you, you never, never, never know. I know. Okay. Let's get into the makes, shall we? So a shout out to the new color makers. Bittersweet that this is the final one, but I'm also incredibly grateful uh, to, the, to the makers. Uh, there are makers that are going to support the new color, obviously, after the launch. But there are four makers that I've worked with since we did the first new color that could work under pressure, work sometimes in a week, and create samples because as soon as Ranger had it and it was approved, those makers got it, they made for live. So a shout out to, to Paula, to Stacy, to Zoe Hillman, and to Sharon because for every one of these new colors, they have created uh, the makes for this. And really, they don't know what it is. I've, I've talked about it before, you know, when we did pink, Zoe was like, you've got to be joking. And I'm like, you're good. But same thing like with brown. I was like, oh boy, Sharon is going to get just brown. But in true style, the makers just do what they do. And I'm so grateful that, that they stuck with it for all of the colors. Kept it a secret, which I'm sure is hard for them as it is for me. And also made incredible makes. So the reason I have those four makers is each one brings something a little different to, uh, to the table. They do something like Sharon does something with, with color. Paula does something more with ideology vintage. Stacy is a bit more shabby chic. And Zoe just gets to embrace the, the dark side, the grunge. So obviously Scorch was definitely in her wheelhouse. So these first cards, uh, Sharon created this. And I think it's, oh, I've got one upside down, of course, as I'm laying this out. So these are done with the embossing glaze. But this just shows how a color can really work with the other colors in the palette. I think it's really cool. Mari, is that showing up okay? That is absolutely perfect. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So, yeah. oh, there we go. Yeah. I couldn't see it on my phone. Now you can tell that it was glaze. So here Sharon went in and just did, this is a stamp, Stamper's Anonymous stamp, one of the, the brush strokes. But you can see how it pairs well. Like maybe this is, I guess, saltwater taffy. This could be see this preserves. But just doing backgrounds with your glaze because your glaze is that translucent color. But it's great sampling to see how brown could be used with other colors, because even if you're not a grunge person and you think, oh, I don't need to use brown, look at how Scorch, because it's just that dark, clean brown, if you will, um, with that, those black nuances, it really holds its own whether you're doing it with, with warmer colors or pastel colors or bright colors. I just think it, it's a great example of how Scorched fits in. So I love those cards. And Tron played around with a lot of other colors, so I'm just going to share a lot of different card styles. I'm always fascinated when uh, makers just kind of do their thing, so thanks. So Sharon made all these. I'm just going to place them down just so you can get the idea of how different products can work. So here is, uh, again, Scorch Timber Embossing Glaze, where she did that perspective butterfly. So this is a die cut that she glazed. So it's a very cool way to use a die cut and get that, that wonderful shine on there. So she did that on an etc. tag. But then you take a look at all of these other cards where, you know, using, you can use direct to paper, you can do paint, a little shakety shake. But see what I mean? Like Scorched in this case looks almost black. But see, if it was black, it might be too stark. So having it with these light colors still gives it that dark value, but almost more like leaded glass than black, if you will. Look at this one. I love this, especially for like St. Patrick's Day. So here you can see, and I think a lot of people mention that too, that 
Scorch timber, when you wet it, it almost has a, like a bronzy value. It's weird. I don't, sometimes when you have a saturation of dye, it does that quite a bit. But here, this, uh, Sharon did this. This is, of course, the layer dots uh, dye that I did with Sizzix. There is that Lucky Love Impress Lift. Lucky is a state of mind. She did some foundry wax. That's the splatter over there. But you can see that's some mica stain back there, the, the green. But look at how that color just, just goes in. And again, because when you start working with, with oxide, right, or adding some inks, you're just going to get some different values than you would with all the other mediums. So cool. Then you have this, of course, you're into Southwest or you're, you like more of those earth tones. It is beautiful because see what I mean? It, it reads as a black, but when you put it with warm colors, it takes on more of a warmer black. Does that make sense? I hope so. I do love scorched timber because it does. It has that, you know, I called it that because when you see scorched wood, it's like sometimes that char is black, but sometimes you really see that brown nuance of, of the wood that was in it. So, and then take a look at that. I know people love uh, brown and pink and purple. Look at how she did that great little mixed media collage, some dyes on a card. But see, you can get those different values of that same brown, but because you put it with the pinks, it takes on more of those cool values because you've got a cool brown to go with the cool purple, cool pink. It's fun. I love seeing, you know, especially coming from one maker's mind. I look at these and I'm like, my gosh, so many different styles where you sit down with a color and you're like, what do I want to do? Well, whatever it is you want to do, but see Scorch Timber is, it was a must, a definite must. So thanks, Sharon, for those. Beautiful. Then, of course, Zoe, there's no doubt that Zoe probably just was sitting at her table just clapping with glee because, you know, <laughs> it's brown <clears throat> and brown is good. Although I've learned, and you'll see from a make, it's not Zoe's number one brown, but that's all right. It's still a brown. It's still a favorite. We can all have our favorites. There's no shame in that. You have to love what you love and do what you do. So here, I'm just going to bring in a, you know, let's see. Oh, no, I got it. Just a little rosette went rolling. There we go. Trying to fit all that. I'm going to put this in first. Okay. So Zoe created these, Zoe Hillman. And it's fun to see that color again, paired with different things. But even if you're just doing vintage stuff, it is a great vintage brown, especially if you're going to put it with a little orange or something rusty. You can see how it holds its own against rust because you're getting not only the brown, but you're getting those, those charred undertones of the scorched timber. When you stamp with it and blend with it, do you see what I mean? How you can, you can place that down and do a, a background and do watercolor because it's dark enough to hold the line art, but then you can also put it on top and it still holds its own. It almost reads as a black, but it, it isn't. So cool. I love that card. I love seeing all of those stamps used. And of course, ideology, Sizzix dies. See, this is a Sizzix die. I do love that. Going with the stamps. Pillow box, see, all the way around. Stamping that, doing a little inky background. Beautiful, of course, the rosettes. We do love Zoe and the hats, right? We do. So, so good. Look at that with the hat, the little label. You can do a butterfly, die cuts. And this is just to give you ideas of how you can still use it, specifically with stamping and inking and kind of creating these backgrounds. But it doesn't always, you're going to see some makes that are like full on saturation of brown, which is also gorgeous. Okay. Absolutely beautiful. I just saw Kaveri be like, this would be an awesome archival link. I agree. Ranger, are you listening? Because just because there's no new distress colors doesn't mean that this color uh, can expand into, you know, archival for sure. And then we have uh, another rosette on the card. And I love how, you know, again, Scorch Timber, this now has a little bit of a, it's still a very cool brown, even though it has it with that yellow, but it doesn't read like Bumblebee to me, like black and yellow would. It still has orange so i love how you know just playing around with the color and just making stuff that's the the fun power of a maker but this was the one i even messaged zoe i'm like so can you explain yourself <laughs> there you go and she did she's like yeah no problem easy <laughs> number one frayed burlap number two walnut stain number three scorched timber and i love that because you do you you stay genuine just because it's it's new doesn't mean it has to be the latest and greatest for you but i hope that it fits in to a palette that you're, you're going to find beneficial. And really as a maker, not everything has to be the favorite, but if it has a purpose for you, that's where it is important to add it to your collection. But in doing so, she's like, I love how it tarnished that plastic trophy cup. I love how it worked on ideology. I love how it became a really uh, dominant look over 
uh, the blue and the yellow. And then she even has like a little stained ribbon. So it did create a very cool, authentic scorched color over the top of this. But I love how just Zoe's keeping it real. That's it. See, her number three, it's now, I would have to say it's my number one brown, but still old paper will probably always, always rain the top. But I love that. I love seeing how you can use the rosettes even in different ways, cards, embellishments, um, and also put into, this is just an ideology frame panel. It could be a shadow box, but great because you can read uh, how those colors impact different things. So much fun. So much fun. All right, let me throw these back in. Great to see, isn't it? It's all about the inspiration, guys. It truly is. It's all about the inspiration. Okay. <clears throat> so I mentioned you're going to see makes where it's full on brown. And this is, this is it. So Sharon made this. Yes, Sharon. The rainbow. She did this. But look at how beautiful this is because here she worked with Distress, threw in some oxide, and paired it with gold metallic embossing powder. So look at how elegant that is. Scorched timber with metallic. Because here, you're getting those really dark, again, almost black tone, but it isn't. You're getting that creamy, dreamy oxidation, almost galaxy-like. But then when you put it with gold, it just keeps this warm, harmonious look. Isn't that stunning? So see, even if you're not like a brown grunge, you could do sophisticated brown. Because Scorch Timber, it's all about the undertones. Like I said at the very beginning of this, it is always about the undertones. Yes, you can do direct to paper and go, wow, it's a dark, a dark, dark brown. And you would be right. But if you go in and start blending and adding water and working uh, with some distress inks and working with oxides, you're going to get different properties that will totally surprise you as to how they ultimately show up. This next one, Stacy did. Again, full on scorch. But Paired it with other things, you know, do, did this wonderful little shabby tag. This is an et cetera tag. Use a little Sizzix die. I love all the little, these are little ideology pine cones that we launched at Christmas. Here's a little pine die. There's some, some glaze with the, the crackle paste. So see the different colors of embossing glaze. So that little blue and green that pops, but look at how wonderful that is with all that scorched timber. You can still create that depth because you're not dealing with black. But if this was walnut stain or anything else, it wouldn't read as dark and saturated. It couldn't because it doesn't have all of those, all of those colors. Look at that a little mica in there. But every color plays well with scorched timber. You've got that little, little pop of red or yellow, a little bit of pink. You've got some green, you've got blues in there. Absolutely. I just love it. I love seeing really the, the colors that you can throw in. Paula created this one. This is a vignette tray ideology. And again, look at how stunning that is that background. I love how she has, it looks like a little, looks like a little foundry wax back there. See that metallic over the texture paste. So it does give it that coppery. I love the coppery vibe on there because look at that right there. See that magic. That's all scorched timber, just water, water, adding and creating these beautiful backgrounds. And then Paula did this whole little vignette uh, ideology. Uh, baseboard window. We've got the little bird, little branch, a little bit of uh, vintage buttons and some lace. But how beautiful. But see, very saturated, but also very beautiful. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be this grungy steampunk. It certainly can be, but it, there is something, there is a sophistication to this color, in, in my opinion. I, I absolutely love how it just shows up on all of these makes in such a different way where you think, my gosh, would I really want to use that much brown? And the answer hopefully is yes, because it's really pretty. It changes everything when you're, when you're working with backgrounds. It's so, so cool. Okay. Then we're going to get into kind of more botanical looking things. Okay. Because it does, it has a softer side. It's, it's beautiful with flowers, I think. So Zoe created these as well, little pillow box, little bag, but see how she just put on that tiny little flower. That's from the the wreath, I just love that a little pop of, of yellow. So you can still do a color palette that you like, like Zoe still did her palette, but you can definitely add a, a little bit of yellow or a softer thing of, of a floral element or a heart. I love this die. Love this vault die set, the pillow box and bag, cute. But when you see how that color, sound like a broken record, just repeat and repeat. 
Sharon created these. This is using scorch timber embossing glaze. But remember, embossing glaze is translucent. So putting it over a color, look at these cards. Woo wee. Absolutely gorgeous over that colorful background. But take a look that scorch timber does kind of change its, in a glaze, definitely changes its property depending on what you put it on, right? Definitely has a little bit of a, a warmer value here and definitely cooler on these two cards. But isn't that just beautiful stamping and using the glaze? And I think a lot of people don't use glaze. They don't use embossing, but embossing glaze is really going to make your image stand out. Absolutely beautiful. So it is, it's softer than black, darker though than, than ground espresso or walnut stain, but it depends on, on how you how you pair it and what you put it with and, and ultimately what products you, you choose. It is a magical color. It's cool. It is my favorite. I, I do believe we saved the best for last. All right, let's keep going with these. I'm just gonna work from this basket. Okay. All right. <clears throat> <clears throat> so Stacy created these. Now, when Paula saw these, she's like, oh my gosh, you just wait because I think this 3D folder is, it might be retired. I believe it is. I think all the 3D folders, um, at least these many ones. I could be wrong. I, I hope I'm wrong because it is a gorgeous folder for Scorch Timber and what Stacy did on these cards. This is using the regular size and the mini size. But take a look how she inked the folder, debossed Scorch Timber with that flower, and then added the color accent over the top. I mean, that's what I said. As far as a botanical and something very vintage, I mean, that color is just, it's absolutely beautiful. It's just perfect. It's just perfect. I love it. I think it's so cool how when you see it, especially on craft, right? Let's, let's be honest about the paper as well. The paper really creates um, a beautiful depth to it. I'm not sure if Sizzix is here, but somebody could look it up and see if this is still a, a current folder. But it's just, I love how she debossed that color and just added that touch because Paul's like, it's just so like vintage dreamy. But then again, we love vintage and we love grunge. But Stacy, these cards really are beautiful how you kind of paired that. It's absolutely beautiful. So love that little detail too. Look at that. A little bit of a little shimmer on the top. Mm -mm -mm. It's just good, right? Like when I see the color done, because I look at this and like I see something vintage. I just see like that, like old leather, like a crack leather sofa, or I just look at like some charred wood. I mean, Scorch Timber is, it's everything that I wanted that color to be, really. I just, it's everything I wanted it to be because it is, it's so, so pretty. And as you get into other seasons, Paula created this, this panel, definitely it's gonna go perfect with fall because now you can add that dark color that's gonna hold its own. Not to say that you can't use ground espresso and walnut stain. I'm not saying you diss the other browns at all. I mean, you saw at the beginning, that I loved already mixing it with other things. But this to me is just really beautiful to see those colors mixed together with, with the pinks and greens and yellows and all of those things of, of fall. Absolutely, I love how Paula can take different imagery, create a collage, get that stitching detail, a little bit of crackle paste on there, and then of course, ideology. We've got the photo booth and the photomatic frame, some layers with all my heart details. So beautiful. It is. It is awesome. Love it. Love it. Because again, you're looking at it and that's the whole thing about these makes. It's about saying like, how would I use it? Would you use it by itself? Ah, you could. Would I mix it with something else? Yeah, you could. Anything you want to do, even if it's going to be the softer side. This one, so charming. They're all charming. They're all, they're like, this is what I was saying about those four makers. They all just do them. And that is what I'm, I'm super grateful for because they do their style with that color because that's the assignment. It's like, you need to take this new color and how would you use it? Well, okay, well, this is what I would do with it. Perfect, that's great. So Stacy created this tag, definitely a lighter side because it's very shabby, but all of that detail you see, that's all scorched timber. So there again, you have a, a dark that is this really subtle, oh, look at how it is on, on that seam binding ribbon. Look at that, it, talk about scorched. See, it doesn't look like it's just scorched or singed. Oh, so, so good. But you can see the stamping back there and how she did a little bit of watercolor. Then you can see scorched timber with gold embossing on there. 
an ideology uh, portrait, a little stick, look at that little, little queen bee on there, some Sizzix, some lace, and just all these little tattered shabby edges. Beautiful. And when you, when you kind of put these, you know, those kind of dimensional makes, they're also very different and very unique. But there again, when you put it with something dark, you still have that pop of color. When you put it with something brighter, you still have that pop of color. And when you add just a little floral element because you're more vintage inspired, you have that too. So all different floral botanical looks with scorched timber. So good. So good. All right. I'm going to get into a mini book now too. Gosh, the I mean, makers like make a few things and then they just kind of went, went crazy and just did so many, ah, so many good things. So I can kind of tell from all the makes that Paula really loved this color too, which so. no surprise because we love it. So Paula created this. This is an ideology um, folio. I, I love how it's got all the sprays on the back, but there again, that dark, that is scorched timber. So you can see how it just really, it creates such a beautiful background in there. And she used it on many things. And a lot of these makers I see in the chat, a lot of these makers will show uh, more detail of their make. Some of them might do tutorials. So be sure to follow the makers uh, just to see if they share any, any other elements. I love how Paula did a little background paper for these printed quotes, you know, print these on vellum and then stitch them uh, onto these cards. But this is just a little Stampers Anonymous stamp. You see that background stamp, but really nice, great, dark, deep color on those tags in there. She even went in and, and stamped that, that linen tape that she's using kind of for these seams, these little pieces, great color to, to grunge and antique, but look at that. Hello. Hello, beautiful. See that gray, green, brown, black. I don't know. It's all scorched timber. Mm -mm. Mm. Oh, good one. That's a great ideology paper to pair it with. Then we have this wonderful little accordion that comes out. This is all, this comes like this from ideology. It comes plain. I mean, you, you get to assemble and do all of the stamping, but you can see all of that wonderful little grunginess. I love the, the swirly twirly stamping on the back. It's a great detail, but look at how scorched not only is great for stamping, but any of those other little details, any of the inking that she added to it. If you're adding it to layers or ideology ephemera, crazy, right? It lets every color just do its thing. It lets every element, whether, whether it's got greens in it, whether it's botanicals um, or organic elements, it really lets that piece shine. So pretty. The details. I know Paul loves doing books just like layer and stitch and yeah. And like I said, um, the other makers will all get the color as well. It just shipped from Ranger when it launches because, well, we only get a few at first, but I can't wait to see what, what all the other makers do. But I did save one, one more make. It's also a Paula make, but I said, please make something grungy, grungy, <laughs> delicious me. It's so good. Look at that. Okay. That is Let's just appreciate that grunge. So this is a, a vignette display panel. She, at, she painted it. So that's the normal color of this, but look at how scorched timber looks on that wood. Do you see what I mean? You're still looking, it's still the wood. So this is the original wood color. It's definitely more warm and look at how scorched timber just makes it look scorched, charred when you paint that on because of that translucent ness of the paint, putting it on and wiping that off. Oh my gosh. It just looks like scorched wood. But then we have all of these uh, tiles. So these are the etc. tiles from Stampers Anonymous. And I love how Paula went in and did just inky background. See how it's really going to be good with rust because it holds its own for that. We've got the embossing glaze where you can create that resist, whether it's typography or wood grain. And I love how she created that background panel and then just taking ideology goodness, some baseboard windows, little photomatic, the, the baseboard. I love the, the quotes on there. Then we've got some ephemera, but you see, this is where it's like that rusty grungy. It is a, it is a great mixer. That is what I would suggest is that if you're, if you're just a stamper, then just stamp with it because that will make you happy. But if you're doing backgrounds, I honestly encourage you to use scorched timber with other colors. 
because that is to me where the magic happens. Can you use it by itself? Yes, you've seen those makes where you can just do a background like Sharon did on that card. It's great, but it's when you add Scorched Timber with other colors, it's going to surprise you with any of the colors. Whether you do it with Salvage Patina, Uncharted Mariner, even a pink or, or a yellow or an orange or a purple, it just has this crazy ability to be, become a chameleon. It can be very, very dark, very scorched, but it can also create this grungy wash without overpowering the color like Blackwood and without turning the color a warm value like Ground Espresso would. So that's really what Scorched Timber is, is all about. It's just absolutely, absolutely beautiful. All right, so we're gonna talk about some other things. So again, thank you makers for making, nice. thanks Mario. I just wanna talk about some, just some other things real quick, just to kind of show you, just gotta, you know, gotta do a little demo. It's not a, it's not a huge wow wow demo, but I just wanna just show you the properties because it is interesting what this color does when you work with it. So I think it's important for me to, to point it out. So I'm gonna take travel mat, it's very nice. Uh, I'm gonna just remove this one. Very nice that we have this. This launch, it's been a busy, busy start to the year. We had the Sizzix launch, then this was a tonic one I think we did beginning of this week. This is the, the travel media surface mat. Many of you asked for it and I'm really glad because to be honest, I wanted both sizes as well. So just need a little squeegee. I don't mind a few air bubbles because it doesn't stay on here forever, but I just use my little, my little Amazon squeegee. Okay, okay. So here's what I wanted to, to share with you about about this color. When you go to use it, especially if it's just going to be an ink pad, to show you. And I'll swipe this onto the paper. That's just direct to paper. This is watercolor card sack. See how dark that is? Okay. When I wet this, because distress reacts with water, it will start to do its thing. It's going to start to wick and do its thing. But what's interesting is when it first starts, it looks very red. And I know this because as I was testing, I'm like, oh my gosh. This is wrong, 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 wrong. It looks like espresso, but what's crazy is how it dries. So you can let it air dry, but I'm just gonna use a heat tool. And as it's drying, I'm just gonna add some other drips of water because I want it to, I want to create some bigger, bigger drips, bigger variation, but I just wanna show how different it's going to look when it's dry. And it does look totally different. Cause see right now where it's wet, see how red that is? Don't freak your freak, cause I did. I was like, no way. Okay. Just gonna dry that. It's the drying. You can really see the distinct difference of where it's dry and where it's still wet. Isn't that crazy? It's so weird how this color starts out thinking, okay, wait a minute, uh, this, is, this is red. No way. And, it, and heat is, has nothing to do with it. I'm just speeding up the, the drying time. If it air dried, it would still air dry the same. You can leave it. I'm just gonna use a, a little cloth because I wanna dab some of this off to get that light value under there too. Because see right now it reads where it's wet, it reads really pink, but you'll see when it dries, it goes to that wonderful scorched. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's magic. It is magic. It's, it's so, look at that. You see what I mean? It is just good. All of this little, it's this, this magic bit. So could you just stamp with this? Like, let's say you stamped a, uh, a crackle or a flower and then spray it, it would wick just like that. But obviously your image would be blurry, but it's just, it's absolutely beautiful that it goes from that crazy weird reddish color to this, well, this scorched look. It's absolutely cool. And if you didn't want to go direct, maybe you were just going to do a background. We can take some of the ink and we can take the ink and we can uh, mix it with a little bit of oxide. So I'll just take both. I'm just going to smash some to that, just add a little bit of water. This is the benefit of having just a larger surface. If you don't have the surface mat, you can still work on that, that little piece that, that comes with it. Do the same thing, just gonna do watercolor. I'm gonna work on the smooth side of the watercolor just to kind of pick this up. Now, if I went into this ink, it is going to transfer exactly how it is. I don't want that. So I just wanna break it up. To me, see how I've got water droplets here, but not much there? I wanna, there you go. I want droplets. Droplets are what's gonna get the magic, but I'm just gonna take my fingers and just drag through it once. Just wipe them off. If you wipe off the ink quickly, it doesn't stain your hands. Longer you let ink sit somewhere, the longer it stains. So if you just wipe stuff off, you're good. Now I'm able to just kind of go in and play in the ink. So I'll just do a couple of little, little taps here and then we'll dry it. So the difference is 
this allowed my ink to go on a little bit lighter at first than this one. This was direct to paper. Remember, this one's just going on a little bit lighter. But this also has some oxide. So I'm going to get some of that, that cool rusty value. But by dragging my fingers through it, that's what's going to keep from creating a really dark spot when you tap your paper down the first time. Okay. There we are. And I'm just moving it just because I want some of that movement. Because see, Scorch Timber definitely has this outline ability because of those dark colors. So play around with that. I'm not going to dry this crispy. I'm just going to dry it a little bit. And I'm going to go back in for another layer. And I'm going to dry again. Because as I always say, wet on wet blends, wet on dry layers. Meaning, if I just kept going and going and going, it would just blend it all together to muck but if I dry it in between, it will actually layer the colors. So there again, just don't be afraid to move your paper. You know, just get those drips to, to create a little bit more variation for you. But you'll see, isn't that crazy? It, it looks so red. Oh, it's gonna dry so good. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, I would imagine that people can just, I saw a comment scorching his own class. I would imagine people that teach could just go in and show Scorch timber used with so many different things in different mediums. So now you can see I'm playing with the drip. So I've never cleaned up the mat. And some people get uh, in, in quite a rush where they just go in and kind of wipe this off and go in and wipe this off. Um, I don't do that. You kind of leave all those little drips that you think may not be much. But as you start building, this is what we're creating. You see those little, those little drippity bits? That's, that's the goodness. And notice that when I'm drying, I'm not drying over here. I want to keep those wet. So I'm moving it over to dry. Mm -mm -mm. Now, if you want something to be lighter, so if you wanted a lighter value, just go in with a paper towel or a cloth and dab off those wet ink spots. I'll show you in just a second. I just want to dry it. There you go. See how that created a light value in both of those? Because I lifted off that ink instead of it being all dark. So you still have some, some great control. Now you can be a little bit more like splash in the puddles, right? Use those little dots for all these all these little speckles. You can always add more ink. There's nothing wrong with that, but a lot of times you don't need to because you want to have some, some distinction in there. You want to have some dark areas and some light areas. There you go. Mm -mm. Okay. It's just good. So I'm going to hold up both just so you can kind of see. This was just ink. So that's where you get that really intense color. And this was ink with a little bit of oxide. So we're getting the intensity of the ink pad, and we're also getting a little bit of that kind of creamy, dreamy vibe because we did oxide. Could you just do all oxide? Yes, you've seen that in the swatch. Or all ink? Yes, see it in the swatch. Easy. But that just shows just from uh, Scorch Timber how, how great it is. It really is beautiful. I'm just going to use a little water. Let me clean this up. Okay. So we've talked about that kind of inking. Not super intense demo, but I wanted to share... I wanted to share something else that also was part of this release that I was very happy Look about. There, tiny Look at these little guys. So these are the tiny blending tools. These were already released. They already started shipping. Um, I know they've been hugely popular, but I wanted just to explain why I wanted to do it. Okay. There is a, there is always a purpose. And for me, it's not like, Oh, I just want another little gadgety thing. There's going to be an intent or a purpose. So this, this is the mini blending tool. And it's funny that we call it a mini, but really based on the blending tool we had years ago that was rectangular, it is definitely mini. But this is the tiny tool. And I've, I've seen other tiny handle tools out there, but one thing I didn't like about them was that the, the handle was much longer. And this part was like the same thickness as this. I didn't like that. The whole purpose of a tiny tool is to get into detailed areas. So this one, we've created this kind of uh, more stumpy handle. So you have something to hold on to. But I also shortened this part, the, I'll just say the, the bridge here, the, the piece that connects the handle to the foam. That little piece, I definitely, we shortened that disc because what's great about this, it has this wonderful domed foam, great little pillow, same thing, it's, it's interchangeable, but it's really designed for inking elements. This is still the background, this is for elements. Could you do a background with this? You could, but I don't think it's going to look very good and it's going to take you a long time because it's little tiny circles. So it doesn't replace a blending tool. The purpose of a tiny blending tool is to ink tiny elements, if you will. So let's just say I have, I don't know, let's go into this bucket of stuff. 
So I have a, like, oh, there you go. Those are where those cards went. It's like, I know I made cards of them. Okay, so let's say you have some die cut pieces. These are things that I die cut birds out of. So we have like, we'll use this bird. Maybe it's a flower that you, we haven't inked yet. Um, it could be some stamps, like maybe you die cut stuff. It's always a good idea. I always say compartmental making. If you have some backgrounds and you have some die cuts, let's do some hearts, because I was die cutting hearts for live. Um, but it could be anything. That's the whole point. It could be whatever you want. It could be leaves, okay? I don't know how much stuff I have, but. And I'll take a label too, because I just saw a label down here. So let's do a foiled one. These are done out of craft. Ooh, this one's inked. Okay. So if I needed to ink a heart, could I? Sure. But you know as well as I do that even with the lightest pressure, because you have so much surface, you might get more ink than you wanted, especially on smaller elements. Okay. That's where the tiny tool came in because yes, you have inking brushes, but most of the time inking brushes are for backgrounds or for stencils. This is also ideal for stencils because I can get into uh, much smaller areas of a stencil than I could get in with this one. You know, this one you had to kind of grind this in. If you use brushes, brushes are ultimately great with stencils, but this now allows me to go in and even isolate some elements of a stencil. But the biggest thing is really how it works with, um, small die cut pieces. I'm going to work with a mini ink pad because I can, because it's a tiny tool, tiny tool, tiny ink, and hello, I have scorched, so why not? So let me just pop this open. I'll put the ink pad in there. Just get some ink. And you really, you can do as much, as much ink as you want. I, I might take a little bit of just different elements. I might even take a little bit of ground and I might take a little bit of walnut. Let's take a little bit. Hold on, I gotta look at something. You guys don't mind. I gotta do something really quick. I need to look in a tin and see this. No, I just have to, I gotta check something. I'm sure I probably shouldn't check it live, but I'm going to because that looks strange to me. Yeah, well, that's odd. Mine is that. Hmm. Sorry, Ranger. Let me open another one. <laughs> Alan's probably, can you hand me that mini set? Sure. Oh boy. Let's hope for the best, shall we people? Scorched. Yeah, I put that on like, oh, I wonder if that's not doing this. I'm sure Alan's like, cut the feed, cut the feed. Oh no, I keep it real, people. Because if I know, you know. Let's see. Could have been just a, a one-off a one oopsie. There we go. That's right. I probably just got a weird hiccup in the giddy-up. Don't freak your freak. You give me the one that's but, not but you know everyone will check it. So there we go. Because it's brown. Whew. Woo. Yeah. He's not the only one relaxed. I'm like, huh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You see it? It would like, just didn't look brown. Okay. Let's go into scorched. Okay. Here's the idea for a mini tool, mini tool. Uh, see, everyone's like, mine's correct. See sometimes because look, it's handmade stuff is handmade, hand filled. It could easily just get accidentally put in a blister wrong. So, so here's the cool thing about a tiny tool is it gives me the ability to ink smaller things. And I love, I don't know why that is, but like when I'm inking small things, it's so easy to just flip this up in my finger. Whereas before, when I was working with this for inking, I always had to put it down to, to ink other things, if that makes sense. So for example, like on the heart, I can just go around, but I, if I needed to just pick something else up, I can just flip the tool up so I can use both hands and then I can go back and just ink the edge. So even on this heart, you can see, I'm really going in around that edge and creating a beautiful inked edge. And if I wanted to blend a little bit more, I can blend a little bit more. I can drag it if I wanted to create that dark, but see, I was able to blend a little bit on the head, but yeah, I love that. I love that I can just ink and flip and ink and flip and ink and flip. Okay. So let's talk about how I would use this maybe with colors, okay? Because you can use it with colors. I like to ink the edges of brown specifically. It's, it's fun, but, you can also make some other little elements. So let me just share what I did. You know me, I am one that it's like, 
if I have something, I want to have it set up the way I'm going to use it the most. Okay. And the way I like to use things, I like to, to have a set set up for me. So I have created my own little set of mini blenders. Cool. Mario's like, what makes you think of these? I'm like, necessity really, uh, because there's not going to be a, a storage tin for this, but this is how many uh, mini blending tools I need 11 because this is my 12th, which is brown. And this stays out. This just goes into my, uh, I have like a little caddy drawer that this is what I have all of my tools in. And I'm just always going to have the brown one because I'm going to use it. I don't know, 90% of the time. So I don't want it in the storage tin. So it's got 11 in here and then this little tray of felt. So how I set this up, these, nothing holds this. This is a mini distress ink storage tin. This is the same tin that holds the mini inks that comes with this little insert. I got rid of the insert. I took the tools. You can see that I've got six at the bottom. Then I just put five going the other way. A couple of reasons. One, interlocking the handles keeps everything from flying around. But two, I don't get ink on the other one when I'm storing it. And then this little tray, because it, it would create a gap otherwise, all I did was take the tiny foam in the packaging, took my scissors and literally cut with my scissors. I'm, I suppose you can go in with a knife if you're good with that, but I just took my scissors, cut right along that seam. Then it took my foam as, as a tray and I literally just attached this. You are the MacGyver. <laughs> hey, I, you gotta <laughs> do it. So you gotta awesome. do what you gotta do. I just stuck this in with a strip of double stick tape right into the middle of the tin. Because as I'm working with it, you can just work with all the colors. Cause I have one for pink, red, orange, yellow, green, teal or turquoise, blue, purple, light brown, dark brown, and like a neutral gray. So like antique linen, a dark brown, and then of course I have my darkest brown. So I would say warm and cool. But this way when, when I'm working, I can just play around with them. And then when I'm done, it's very easy just to, in my opinion, just reorganize them. Cause you just drop it in between. All you have to do is drop it in there and then it's done because this little thing for whatever reason just kind of keeps them in there. That is the cutest thing ever. So that's what I did on mine. But, but my point on that is let's say we wanted to ink like a flower. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some mini inks off to the side. You can work a couple of different ways. My suggestion, if you know you're going to be inking in multiple colors, is use multiple colors. So use your palette for what it is. So maybe we want to do a little bit of yellow, a little wild honey, and you could go onto the glass or the medium mat. It doesn't really matter um, how you want to do it. It just depends on the colors that you want to do. Then we'll take a little bit of green, a little bit of that was some peeled paint. That's a little bit of forest moss. Um, then I think I'll do, I'll do a little scorched timber, a little scorched timber and put some of that down. Okay. That's good enough for me. You can do really whatever it is that you want to do. But now I can just, because I can identify, once you have ink on it, you can see it. Some people paint their handles, do stickers. You, you do what works for you. But this is a way that you can use little bits of, of colors and blend them together without doing it on your ink pad. You can do it on your ink pad, but this way it just allows me to go in and see again, I just move this out of the way. It's, it's weird. I do it now in habit because I've used these tools for a long time now before we launched them. But I just love the fact that I can kind of look and see what it is that I want to do. And I don't have to worry about moving this and getting ink on things. It's just my movement, I guess. Strange, isn't it? I think it's kind of strange. All right. Then let's do, I'm going to do a little bit of brown. I'm going to take a little scorched. And now for this, because I can go right into the middle of that, I'm just going to take that little tiny tool. Just do that little blend in the middle. Perfect. So I've got a little bit of, little bit of schmutz on there. I'm going to go in and just do some little heavy inking on the edges. You'll see why in a second. I'm just going to pounce that down. Okay. And now we'll do some green. So for green, I'm going to start with a little bit of peeled paint, do some of the leaves just on the edge of that. And you'll see like, because it's a thin flower, see it's got like a little broken neck. I'm not worried about that because I'll, I'll end up gluing it down to a card or whatever. So now I'm going to do a little bit of forest moss. I love the fact that because this is a tiny blending foam versus a brush, you can see how easy it is to control the blend. I don't have to dab off. You see, I'm going into the ink and I'm not dabbing off on anything because we have blending foam. Blending foam works different than a blending brush. I mean, every tool has a different, a different purpose. And I don't think there's one perfect one. Um, 
Just think it's whatever's going to work for you. So now I'm going to take that color and I'm just going to go a little bit darker on the edge as well. Okay. Do a little pounce. So ideally easy to blend. You get that idea, but you can also take this. See, I do love that. There's my colors, my palettes in one little tin. I don't have to go chase them down or do anything. And you know, obviously filling those, I do have a little bag of foams now, so that's good. But I'm going to take this and just spray it because that's going to allow my inks to, to wick and I'll dry it. Now, do you have to do this? My gosh, no, you could be totally done, All right? But I'm just going to dry this because all that's going to do is that's going to take the ink that I just put on there. It's still going to look blended, but it's going to create this, this different look. I, I really like this effect. And it's, that's the beauty of die cutting stuff out of watercolor paper. You know, you don't have to get it all figured out ahead of time. You don't. Okay. So here we go. Take a look at that. See how scorched timber just kind of wicked out beautifully into the center. Then we've got those yellow colors, a little mustard seed, a little bit of wild honey. And then you can see even how our greens just modeled and blended beautifully. Little peeled paint and forest moss. That's why it's nice to have a couple of different color values when you're, when you're inking, because then when you add that water, you will get that beautiful mix. And it's super easy. Could you have gone in and did this with a brush? And do, yes, but I'm not good like that with a brush, right? To me, brush, you have to be very you know, meticulous. You know, you want to paint those little petals. Here, I know how to ink blend. And so that's where these tiny blending tools have changed, especially when I work with die cuts and stencils, because things that I couldn't ink before, not that I couldn't, but I wouldn't bother inking because I'm like, I don't have time for that. I would just kind of leave it. Or when I would try to ink a lot of pieces for, for packaging, I would have to recut it because I would try to use, I'd try to be as light handed as possible. And then boom, covered half of that with, with brown. But this just allows so much more control especially for inking. So that's really the purpose of the tiny blending tool. Still to do blending, but do it a couple of different ways, okay? Creating it on, on this side, or of course, uh, creating your own little custom set. Cute though, isn't it? Yeah, it was this tray that figured it out because before they were rolling around and that was driving me crazy. I'm like, oh, I need to build a divider. And I'm like, eh. And then it just so happens that when I cut that packaging, I have replacements with me anyway. So if I needed to switch it out or these are so tiny that I don't, I don't think I would need a set for ink and a set for oxide. Uh, I would just make sure that I would wipe it off before I use it. So anyway, really fun ways to, to work with the color. I love having this little travel mat. It was fun when I saw how many people were excited to have this travel one. You don't have to use it on the, tra the glass uh, medium at the travel one. You can still use this on the bigger one. It just now you have a bigger working space. Maybe you don't want the whole one that covers because there's one that covers the large one as well, but quite fun. A great thing to use uh, with the tiny blending tool, right? Okay. How do we do on Scorch, Mario? Good? So good. I think we did really good. It was a lot of fun to, your, to your just kind of see. The, the, the tin was really good. I'm going to put the, I'm going to put the color back. Okay. Let me get this stuff out of the way. All right. Put that back on there. Woo wee. All right. What else do you need to there do? we have it. No, I'm good. I'm just going to, oh, see, look at that. It's kind of, I'll open that up. Look at this. So much fun, so much fun. So that is scorched timber. Oh my gosh. The 72nd color to distress, 20 years in the making. I couldn't be happier. There it is. Look at all that stuff. 